um, people are going to experience a different level of presence. So um, we're so when we start talking about that later on, um, just know that we're probably leaning more towards how people feel versus the actual tech specs of those things, right? We're not talking about like like the field of views and stuff like that to get presence. Although we will yeah. talk about some some uh, tech hardware later. And so now we're going to really get into it, right? Hardware. I love let's, it. Let's talk about yeah. Hardware. So, so moving on. So that, I mean, that's a really great setup. Um, just keeping in mind sort of where, where we are, where we are in the current state of technology, right? Preaching and knowing our audience. We come from James and I come from K-12 backgrounds. We've been in education for nearly two decades each. So that's 20 years. I've got a lot of gray hairs to show for it. Uh, <laughs> turning into a skunk in that picture right there. Yeah, um, that actually, but it's, uh, that's, uh, that, Headshot of mine is actually yeah. like three years old. That's before Listen, I started getting tons of gray hair. So I'm going to keep this for the rest of my life. You're this not old and gray in that photo? You look pretty old and gray to me. I mean, but <laughs> just, okay, all right. Just, moving on. Out, Brad, you're the new. You're the new. <laughs> <laughs> all right. So moving on. Um, just again, keeping in mind our audience. Let's, let's just, we've talked about spatial. We've talked about presence and why. But the question really for us is to is how to maintain this momentum, right? We come to these conferences, we hear all the great things. We hear from industry experts, grandfather of VR, Tom Furness, we hear from Alan Braylon Wang, and we hear from all these people, and we're like, wow, as educators, how are we gonna do this, right? And I'm preaching to the choir by you know, bringing up a picture of the Oculus Go, but we know that this is one of the lowest hanging pieces of fruit for our audience. We know that at $150, this three degree of freedom device gives schools the ability to very easily give students access to 360 video and even some interactive pieces of software where you would teleport as opposed to walk. And so it's important yeah. to note that as, as, as old as that piece of hardware might seem to some of us, okay, as compared to, let's just say like a Quest, um, it's, it's important. It's still relevant. Um, I would argue that maybe cardboard is sort of definitely on the way out for K-12, but for sure, the Go and other 3 off devices are important for our industry. And so looking, speaking to uh, these few categories, so hardware, software, management, logistics, right, curriculum alignment and expectations, that's sort of what we're talking, going to be talking about for the next few minutes here is, okay, you're inspired. You got this momentum, you want to learn in this fashion and inspire students to want to participate and be engaged in your subject matter. So you use VR in passive ways that provide, and I'm going to steal this from Cucamonga Unified, but notice and wonder, right? So you might start a lesson with a 2D, or excuse me, a 360 passive 360 experience. There's no interaction, but you've encouraged them to want to engage in the forthcoming lesson because now you've engaged them in a way that they prefer to learn, right, James? So what are kids doing right now, right? They're playing Beat Saber. They've got PlayStation VRs. They've got all these things. <laughs> yep. And when we bring those tools into the school, that's a preference factor. That's qualitative data for us that we like to use to leverage against the student's unwillingness to typically want to learn, right? right. So we bring in these tools, and we got these tools. So you got Oculus Go 3 off, Quest 6 off. You got things like uh, the Varro headset, $6,000, 10 if you're a developer. You've got retina quality uh, imagery, but very expensive. I and mean, we'll get there, right? Um, yeah. I mean, even moving forward here, this, uh, I'd, I'd love to give credit for this shot, but I, I, I can't because I don't know where it came from. But credit to whoever took this photo. Um, there are schools, including... Shannon Putman School, who have got massive amounts of six off headsets, and they are attempting to do their best to align learning with hardware like yep. this in classroom settings like this, right? And so the question, I think, James, I'm just interrupt me. The question is okay, you like the idea of spatial learning, you like the idea of engaging students in a technology that they might be excited to use. You like the idea that you can afford it at $150 or $400 for a quest, but then there's expectation. Uh, then there's the logistics, right? Like, yeah. how do we? Okay, this is just. I mean, logistics are the most difficult yeah. thing for educators right now, and you know that's what Absolutely. the appeal was of, of uh, man, not knocking because I love Google yes. Expeditions, 
that that one application launched so many people into spending thousands upon thousands of dollars to bring it into their classroom because they saw the potential, but they also like that management aspect of it, right? Yeah. You know, uh, when are we going to get to the ease of management and uh, those uh, kind of easing up on the burdens of logistics, like what we have with Chromebooks and uh, iOS devices and even laptops? When are we going to have that, you know, move into the, the realm of VR? And we're starting to see a little bit of that already um, across multiple that includes with the Go and with the Quest. Um, one of one of them that uh, me and Stephen have been playing around with for a little bit, and uh, he, Sean actually spoke at Educators in VR, is Grove Learning. I'm not sure if uh, any of our audience members got to uh, listen to Sean speak, but uh, that management platform is, is different. It's um, It actually has the, the take of, instead of being based in IT, it has its basis in the classroom teacher, right? Yeah. How do we manage what the children are doing uh, effectively? Like, how are we keeping them safe and how are we driving them to the experiences we want them to experience? Um, and also with Springboard, I know Stevens had some communication with Springboard, um, which uh, that now uh, they have, what they, it's with Pico, right? Pico, right, Springboard. right, right. Yeah. Um, which, if y'all don't know Pico, uh, I highly recommend looking into Pico. I'm a big fan of their hardware. I think um, it's it's world class. It's really great. Um, and these these type of management systems really solve a lot of logistic problems inside of the classroom, which is the primary. Um, there's some other things that, um, and uh, we can speak to a little bit uh, because we've run into it when you have things like uh, the Quest or the Go or even Pico, or any device that's not um, like what I said, the, the Chromebooks, the, mm -hmm. uh, the iPad and stuff like that. And that is, how do you get applications and stuff on devices? And so this is, this is an area where I think there's strive still to make. And, you know, one of yeah. the workarounds that we use is um, dedicated, um, dedicated accounts in the Oculus MDM or something of that nature. Uh, I don't know, you've done but, a little bit of that, right, Stephen? Yeah, the other issue, too, uh, going along with what James is, is talking about is when we let, – let's go back to the, you know, the battle between Android and iOS, okay? In a school setting, which device were we most apt to choose? Let's call it two years ago, maybe three years ago. It's probably going to be iOS because – the software ecosystem that was available was diverse. It was huge as compared to what Android was offering, right? right? Even though Android at the time was a much cheaper solution. So you had these like, you know, seven inch, $150 tablets as opposed to an iPad back in the day that was 500 bucks. Fast forward to today as schools are trying to decide whether or not to go to Oculus or Vive or Pico or any of these companies for a headset, Let's, let's not even get started. We don't, we don't have enough time to get started on the distribution of software and what ecosystems each one of those separate hardware manufacturers has access to to then provide content. Because if you back up to where James was at about Google Expeditions, you bought these kits from Best Buy and the like, you had access to Google Expeditions. What else did you really easily have access to? Not What's much. That? So What's like, this and worse, yeah, and worse is not only what do you have access to, because uh, those of us who played around with expeditions and we had like uh, you know we had Android phones at first, and then we were doing yep. that. Uh, I think everybody did the same thing. Let me go to YouTube and pull through videos and stuff like that. How do you manage those things? And there's still no real good answer for no. that type of application. Uh, Daydream was supposed to sort of help with that, but of course I think we all know where yeah. that ended up. Um, so it's, it, it, it's still in flux right now. And then, of course, in the midst of all of this, in the midst of all of this, the world of education, you have to worry about, okay, this is what I'm trying to teach. Here's my curriculum. Here's my yeah. the things that I want to get across. How are we doing alignment with VR, with, uh, I'm not going to say traditional. I'm just going to say with the current method of, of education. And, uh, you know, I'm going to hypothesize that, um, VR is going to be very disruptive to that because um, I don't. I think if you try to force these th two things together, it's going to be like a square peg in a round hole. Um, and so I think it's going to yeah. it's going to take people to look at this from um, outside of their current curriculum and say, 
way. This is how it's going to impact our learners because if we look at the research, research is showing the acquisition of knowledge and the skill sets that they're, that they're pulling in, not just the ones that, they, that teachers think are important for content, but also for things that make students better people all around, right? Like, you know, I don't want to, you know, I'm not going to sure. jump on talking about empathy and stuff like that, but that is a part of it. I mean, um, they're giving these kids experiences outside of their small world. Um, it can give them a better perspective. So I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. No, that's a, um, what are, so what are your thoughts about about that? Because I don't think I've shared that with you about that disruptive thing. It's just something that I've been contemplating over the last several months. No, it's true. It's true. I mean, this technology could be is is highly disruptive. Um, and I, I think the, the issue that we run into as educators is the question that we get from our peers, which is, and just correct me if I'm off, off base here, is I've got this pedagogy, I've got this curriculum I've got to teach, and what do I have to displace if you want me to adopt this new technology, right? And so I go back to, and I think Brad, I want to steal this from you, actually. So you had brought this to my attention. It makes total sense because uh, we all went through this, right? But when we were going from paper textbook to uh, digital, like, PDFs, that was all it was. We, we simply went from, like, a digital textbook from Pearson or HMH or whatever publisher was out there, and they gave us a PDF that, they would, that we would run on an Android tablet. And, but that was disruptive. I think that... What we're seeing now is going essentially from that high level view of digital learning into, again, spatial learning. And I think as a disruptive technology, the gains and benefits that come along with presence far outweigh the, the headaches and the logistics and the expectations that are going to be broken and the difficulties that we're going to face trying to keep this momentum going. I mean, I, I can't, Chris, how long, Chris, we've known each other for at least two and a half, three years. And I got to say, it's been, it's been three years of really hard evangelizing with, I don't know how much, how much adoption, you know? Yeah. It just feels like it's now just starting to get going. This is kind of the year that I felt some real genuine momentum. Yeah. No, I, I would have to agree. So yeah, I have hugely disruptive technology. Um, and, and this is why we're so heavily invested into it. Um, but well, and, and it is, and it, and it is, in, it's, it's still a very small percentage, but the uptick that you've seen from 2018 to right now is exponential, yes. even though it's still small. Good it point. Is exponential, so it is gaining momentum and we're still seeing, of course, people going by like expeditions kids to, to kind of get, Foot in, foot in the door, but I'm also seeing a lot of people step outside of the education realm, and obviously, like you know, what you're seeing, like with Go and Quest, uh, the reason there's a demand for MDMs for things like that is because there's so many people that are like, wait, I know that this has some really great applications for my students to learn. I'm going to buy it, and I'm going to figure out a way to make this work. And yeah. so companies are coming along, going, man, if they're going to do that, then let's what let's see what we can do to help support them, which I think is a really good kind of um, yeah. You know, it's kind of like a grassroots movement <laughs> to get uh, VR and education mainstream, to be honest. Um, so can I just jump in for a sec here? Yes, uh, yes, Brad. And so, um, and I, I think we'll get to this, but, you know, we started the PORTS program, the distance learning program, well over 15 years ago. Um, and we were in the same place with bringing live video two-way live video into classrooms that you are right now with VR. It's the same exact thing, right? It's, it's you know, districts had to invest in $10,000 polycom units that could be rolled into a teacher's room or used in a, in a library or media center and kids had to funnel through. Uh, firewall be open, content filters had to be managed, all of that stuff, right? And and we we just hung around long enough to 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 see it where now, you know, with you know things like Skype, Zoom, FaceTime, whatever, and your favorite platform, you just send a link to a teacher, and voila, there's our interpretive ranger live and in real time. 
And, and man, I, you know, you know, I'm just sitting here listening to you guys and I'm thinking about all the times that I spent in back closets, you know, in <laughs> router rooms, in LAUSD, you know, and, and what we did to get to that point, you know, we had to yeah. go to state legislature to get them to see the value of just having high speed network connections into schools. Right. And, and, and then convincing districts that it would be okay to allow live video that we weren't going to you know have their students have access to things they weren't able to you know we didn't want them to see um so you guys are th this is the same exact thing you know it's three-dimensional mm -hmm. and i know i know we're going to get to the content and the pedagogy part of it you know what we provide but that's also a part of the story as well like live video is becoming a thing but what do you do with it and how do you provide access for as many people in a meaningful way that you can you know and there were pay to play situations like you know you could pay 150 dollars and talk to an author or you know the jason mm -hmm. project was free but you had to chat in and you know so our program is always and this is why i'm so excited about this kind of technology is how do we provide access to as many students as possible so that they can have what you started this discussion out with which is an experience that provides them you know still a, a platform to learn or to engage or to build a community with their with their their um, you know their, their fellow students and in our case you know if the if the the recipe is right are they close enough to visit that place and then experience it in real time in yes. real life and will the learning outcomes be better because they were better prepared for that visit because they had high quality experiences prior to the visit so i'm sorry i just i had to jump in there were some things that i you know no he just oh sorry, sorry and he, sorry. And he can't even move like he's just <laughs> i'm so and I'm from New York, and I'm from New York. You know, I've got I'm flailing over here. I'm flailing. <laughs> no, I, I'm telling you, it's that's perfect because that's that's really what what we're really coming down to is really about this this idea of equity and access. And we're going to look at a couple other things, and yeah. we may talk about this a little bit more. Um, but our thoughts on things like equity and access are um, we try to take a, a larger, broader view of it. But one of the things you touched on was um about like the cost and stuff like that well you know right now the cost is high but we also know if history shows us anything about technology um the same technology uh, becomes you know less expensive over time while new innovation happens so we know that we're it's going to become more widely available but really how are we going to use it and how are we going to harness that and what those experiences are like? because the thing that we want to really uh, kind of have our students have access to is you know what Steven said, we want them to have the, the, the preference, like we want them to be able to look at something and say, yes, this is something that I want to use to learn with or learn through. Um, we want them to have that notice and wonder that Steven had mentioned earlier, we want them to be engaged. But all the while, all this is happening, we're basically, we are using spatial learning to pull in those long-term memories for content and skill development, um, not in a sneaky way, just in a way that we always oh, no. learn, right? No, we have totally uh, hijacked hijacked their senses for sure, right? <laughs> we have totally yeah, hijacked not, their senses. Not yeah. necessarily in a way that's different from yeah. what Brad mentioned about an area that was close to them that they could go and visit. But I think it was an interesting point that you made that was if they experienced it in VR first. Are they more are they more well equipped uh, equipped? And what I mean by that is, are they is their brain uh, at a point where they can absorb uh, different and more dense information about where they're going if they've been exposed to it in some way that is spatial already, you know, like, so, um, so that's a really good point, right? Because Brad, we actually did that. Sorry to cut you off. Dave. We actually did that with Napa County office of education and angel okay. Island. So, so let's actually get into those slides. And I'm glad you're here, Brad, because we can actually talk to this particular experience. So, what you're seeing here is a partnership between um, between us, California Parks, and also Napa County Office of Education. And what you're seeing there on the screen is a 360 image projected, I know, um, of a park ranger on Angel Island. Now, if you know anything about Angel Island, and I know this now because I was a part of this experience, and I got to learn from this ranger, basically, if you were immigrating into the United States, that's where you would have stopped off. Do I have that correct, Brad? 
1910 to 1940. It was built predominantly to keep Asian Americans out of this country. I'm Japanese American. I can't speak Japanese, but that's that's terrible. No, I'm joking. So they were there. They were detained for longer periods of time. It, it's awkward because the audience, it, we get no interaction from the audience. You know what I mean? As far as audio is concerned. <laughs> and so sometimes I'm like yeah. waiting and I feel like I'm talking to myself, um, but I do that all the time. So, so in this experience, going back to <laughs> Caitlin, <laughs> going back to what James <laughs> and Brad were talking about, um, this idea of priming students, right, before a lesson is important. And in this case, we actually had the kids in VR, let me pull up those slides, okay, prior to them actually going out to Angel Island on a boat to go ahead and visit with that same ranger okay so we started off with vr we had them have the perspective of a 360 camera that was right next to that ranger he was talking to them looking at the camera which is essentially him looking into the eyes of the student if you're in a headset right Jay? right guys mm -hmm. and we were able to broker questions back so just like a skype interview as the students had questions they could ask those questions and then the ranger could then answer them right back all while being in VR, all while feeling present and having agency over where they're looking. And then the piece of it that I don't know is, Brad, please help us here, is, is, is when those same students went to Angel Island, did you perceive any noticeable difference between how they observed or took part in their experience physically there as opposed to students that had not done VR prior? And the answer can be no. That's fair too. No, I, the answer is I don't really know, but I can tell you from the experiences that we have, and we've done this for the, about two years now, even students that just do a two-dimensional live video call with that ranger in the field, yeah. they, they are reporting back to us that those kids are better behaved, more prepared to learn, and, and have a better experience. And, and that's because you can through a lot of the stuff that you would do on a regular field trip, right? Yes. Hey, make sure you bring water. Bears aren't going to eat you. I'm in this safe place. Look, there's bathrooms to my right. You're going to be able to pee. You're going to, you know, snakes are not going to be poisoned, that kind of stuff. Um, and, and really what, and it's kind of, it's, it's self-serving and maybe intrinsic, but the kids get off the bus and they see that person in real yeah. life. And they go, hey, we saw you on TV. And it's all of a sudden there's this, all of a sudden there's this, um, there's this instant kind of, you know, Rapport connection with, between yeah. them. Yeah. So, oh, so I can't help, so I can't help but think that providing similar immersive experiences in VR, whether they're live or video on demand, um, aren't going to we're not going to we're going to see the same gains i think that nice. you know because it is it's, it's preparation touch points right it's the yes. age-old education adage of tell them what you're going to tell them tell them again and then ask them what you told them right mm -hmm. and 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 then you know and here's here's an excellent way to to do multiple engagement points and it's not different than what's you know Zoos, aquariums, museums, parks have done all along. We used to send them three ring binders and said, "Here's a here's an image of the historic house museum that you're going to see. You know, look for the tea kettle when you get into the kitchen." Right. right. And you know, and you know, that's maybe the teacher brought the thing, the printout or the scavenger hunt or whatever. And now we're doing it in real time and providing more engaging and um, and one-off experience for those students. And then, you know, and again, bring it to this three-dimensional world, either live or video on demand. And I think that's gonna, it's, I, I just see such potential in it for sure. You know what, Steven? Yes. Um, why don't we do this? Um, What's that? Why don't we look at some of the, the, uh, the qualitative data from the students? I like it. Right? Um, I like it. This, uh, you know, I got a slide in there, it's got some products or whatever. We don't have to look at that. What I'd like to do is look at, look at um, if y'all are okay with this, yeah, because I want to make sure we have enough time to give Brad uh, uh, some time to give us the guide or the tour. Um, let's look at some of that data, and then let's move into the. Let's do it. Let's. Do it. <laughs> All right. So we did take some surveys, right? We wanted to grab some data from the students, right? And it's interesting. We asked them a few questions, right? And one of those questions was 
what was the most memorable part of the 360 VR field trip? And so some students said, learning about the history of the island. And so for us, that was interesting because they weren't just enamored by the technology, but they also remembered points uh, like actual content, right? They were interested in the actual content that the ranger was uh, giving them. Uh, same question, uh, but what's inter interesting here is that one of the kids felt like they were kind of floating. And I think that's, again, important. As we're developing these experiences, developers need to be very conscious of their audience. And so that 13 to high school, 18 uh, range, let's be conscious and have those experiences if they're locked uh, at about that height. Moving on, uh, same question. I was able to experience and visit a place where I probably wouldn't go. Again, huge use case for VR and this technology that we're using today inside of Engage. Um, Again, same, uh, same oh, okay. Would this person prefer a traditional 2D or a 360 VR field trip? And this one said that I'd prefer a three, 360 to feel present and being there. Great. I think that I primed him with that answer too hard, but I know <laughs> that uh, I think I've dropped the word. The data, I didn't manipulate the data, but that, that was a genuine <laughs> answer. But I got to say, I, I dropped the word present a lot that day. Um, <laughs> Another one, I would be scared to move around. It's a good thing that we had them locked in 360. And then here's another interesting one. Uh, James, yeah. go ahead and take this one because I know you, you really like this one. I do like this one um, because, you know, I also love being, going places and I love experiencing. Um, and they enjoy the VR field trip, but they like the feeling of being there. And this really comes back to where we started this whole conversation. It was about presence and not necessarily presence as in the technical side of it, not showing presence, but really the kind of the um, the cultural adaptation of presence and the way that people feel when they're there. And not necessarily that I would like for this person to prefer to be in VR over that, but I, I can't help but think that as the technology advances more and we um, we have new tools coming out. Uh, development becomes even uh, more uh, advanced yep. that the presence will be increased for everyone. And so when they go in to feel um, what it's like, they actually feel what it's like, you know, and I got a, a next slide, but we don't have to look at it, but it's got things that are trying to help increase, um, increase that presence, right? Like, like the Tesla suits, um, the uh, you've probably seen the uh, the the field Cat reel VR. technology, okay, uh -huh, kind of gimmick, gimmicky. Uh, uh, this Dexmo right here. If y'all have not seen this, y'all have to go look it up on YouTube. It's by Dexter Robotics. It 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 basically uh, applies out, outward pressure from the outside of your hand when you're grabbing something. So like imagine this uh, this mug of coffee right here. If I had a Dextra uh, glove on when I grab it it's going to restrict around that so that I can pick it up and it feels like I'm actually grabbing a hold of something. It's really interesting yeah. and very unique. Um, and it actually is variable. So like if you're grabbing like a rock, it's very rigid. So it doesn't have any give versus if you're grabbing like a, a racquetball, it, you can grab and you can squeeze it. So it's pretty cool. And we're going to see more of these things come out and you can see none of these things are what I would call uh, very accessible right now. Um, they're kind of <laughs> cumbersome. Right? But as techno technology advances, I think that we're gonna we're gonna see this slimline and then increase oh, our. We level. lost you there, James. We we see oh. you, but we don't got your. There you go. There's your audio. Okay. Am I good? Okay. Yep. Um, so why don't we why don't we go ahead and let's go let's let's roll that beautiful green <laughs> footage. Uh, All right. The new hotness. It's gonna lead us into what Brad's gonna do for us today. All right. Let's do this here. This. <laughs> uh, oh boy. Can't do this without having a good clip. We have to have no, a good no. clip. No, no. Your memory's back. How come you don't remember the light of Zartha? I must have neuralized myself in order to keep the information from myself. Ah, good plan. Wait, wait, man, what you doing? I always do the driving. Wait, no, whoa, whoa, whoa. Oh. I remember that. What you remember is you used to drive that old busted joint. See, I drive the new hotness. <laughs> old and busted. New hotness. Old oh, busted. <laughs> so, I love the fact that, and, and I just love the fact that he, he ends it with 
old busted new hotness, right? And we're not making light and saying that anything that we're using in the classroom today is old busted. What we're saying is we're really excited for, you know, the flying car and what's new and how we can bridge. Yeah, equity and access. Oh, we've been waiting for that forever. forever um, yeah. So actually, all right, uh, let's yeah, do it. I'm so glad that Brad's here because one of the hottest things that we're going to do is obviously we're in a shared experience right now. Yes. Um, and that's really cool. Um, but there's something that's really even better about connecting with people that are experts, taking us through a tour of a actual location. And so that's uh, kind of the, the thing that we're going to do today. And yeah. so, uh, you know what? I think that we have something special to take us there. Am I, am I right about that, Chris? He's back there typing. Look at him. Yeah, he's doing something. He's looking very important. He is looking very important. And he's loading up. Uh-oh. 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 Mm -hmm. Watch your heads, people. What's oh, happening? Lord. We're being transported. So... Center. Oh, no. Oh, no. <laughs> that was amazing, Chris. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so what I James, you think it's fair? Like we can just unmute everybody and then we'll let Brad guide us. We're going to go into yeah. um, a couple of places. Chris, just so you're aware, we're going to yep. do two scenes. One is a still, one is video. Okay. And I'd love for Brad to just uh, guide us through and then uh, we can see how people feel about it and jump in. People, if you have any questions or you want to interrupt him uh, with uh, thoughts. Yeah, Brad, Brad, oh, there you are. All right. We can unmute everybody whenever you have a chance yeah. there. Everyone is unmuted, and they're, they can soft oh, okay. mute themselves Perfect. or not. If I do hear a lot of noise, I'll go ahead and, and hard mute. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Brad, whenever you're ready, take it away. Well, welcome, everybody. So um, we Woo. have just transported to... Uh, a park in Monterey, California called Point Lobos State Natural Reserve. And uh, we are in a part of the park in a museum called the Whaler's Cabin. So the Whaler's Cabin was active in the early 1900s and um, it's in the Whaler's Cove part of the uh, park. So anybody want to guess what the uh, Whaler's Cabin in Whaler's Cove helps to interpret? Hmm. Hmm. I don't hmm. know. Boy, I, I tell you. All right. Okay. Well, I'll just tell you. It's whaling industry. There you go. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, yes. oh, got it. Yes. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. This is you know this is a the 360 inside the the museum, and you know we feel like it's really important because this museum is actually not open all the time. So even if you were a, a visitor to the park, or you were a school group visiting the park, you may not get inside this museum because it's opened only by volunteers, you know, certain hours of the day. Yeah. So what an amazing way to be able to, um, to bring, you know, a piece of the history of Whalers Cove here at Point Lobos, um, you know, to, to students. <laughs> and, what, so, and, and typically we would have multiple scenes here of, of 360 imagery that we would walk our students through, right? So we'd go from point A to point B, C, D. Right. Yep. So if I, okay, so uh, yeah, I'm kind of, so the giant thing in front of you, anybody know what that giant musk looking thing is? Oh. Mm. I don't know, but it's, it's got some interesting things coming out of it. <laughs> yep. Those um, interesting things would be tentacles. Oh. And this is in a, this is in the mollusk family. It's actually an animal that's highly endangered in California right now. Um, and this would be an abalone. 
So um, um, the twenty near like what I want. I haven't seen this before, and the room doesn't really do it justice. But what you can see is a bunch of avatars floating around and somebody hosting it. So like these are actual people hanging out, listening to this talk. <laughs> yeah, so, so 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 definitely for the next one we're gonna hide the avatars. So yeah, so we have the ability okay. to engage to also have the avatars visible to hide them. So Brad, we're gonna go over off to the next scene, all right? Sounds good. All right, let's do it. Going back into the 360 room. You know what I love is that we it looks like we're all in a sequel to Honey I Shrunk the Kids. That was fabulous. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I love it. All right, so here we go. Let me find this one. Here we go. Uh, <laughs> this is so cool. Yeah, cool. All right, so we've just taken you from above ground at Point Lobos State Natural Reserve to below the water. So this is a... a a 360 dive done by our partners at CSU Monterey Bay. They have an immersive um, video program where they're trying to capture um, lots of great underwater 360 video for research purposes. Um, if you look down, you'll see a, a buddy diver, and that's because you always want to dive in at least a pair of people. Um, and we're actually going through the kelp forest here. So many people don't know, um, but off the coast of California, there's 124 state marine protected areas and the marine protected areas are places that um, provide regulation for all the plants animals and you know the the, the biome there to um, hopefully uh, provide some sort of safe haven and also so that we can see some health of our oceans um, kind of rebound um, so some of the fish that you're seeing are rockfish. The plants that you see um, when we were kind of going through that, those are giant kelp plants. And, you know, giant kelp is one of the fastest growing plants on Earth. Um, can grow up to two feet in one day. Um, here we are going by some of the rock walls. This is off a of monastery beach, so not a very deep dive. But we like to show this video because everyone's like, oh, that's not that interesting. Well, you're right, because we've killed a lot of the wildlife that live off the coast here in, uh, in California due to overharvesting, um, also due to climate change, sea level rise issues. Um, these things all play a part in, um, in, in you know, the health of an ecosystem. And the marine protected areas, which is coming up on a 10-year kind of cycle, they, they were enacted about 10 years ago, um, you know, is it's it's gr this group gives a great example of like a point in time survey of what the health of this place looks like. So, you know, we're really excited to be able to to use uh, this kind of 360 imagery and video for students that they can they can draw their own conclusion about uh, yeah. the underwater environment. So. Um, any any questions? Anybody? Any divers in the audience? Um, I did want to point one thing out. Um, a lot of people might have felt a little bit nauseous on that video, but I did notice as soon as the text came up. If you look at the text, it takes away a lot of that sense of nausea. So just just something I wanted to point out. Very good point. Brad, can um, you tell us where again? <clears throat> they can find you tell us briefly about the program again what california state parks is doing and what the ports program acronym stands for um, sure, and then sure. if they want to get a hold of you what sort of resources they have access to even if they're not in california yeah totally so so our you know our bread and butter our flagship resource of ports which stands for parks online resources for teachers and students will always be we think um, the video conference experience. So um, you can find us at ports.parks.ca.gov. Okay. Um, you know, you can find us uh, and get information there. Um, we are partnered with Google Expeditions because we see that there is, you know, some play there. Um, so we're trying to get some of our um, some of our content onto Google Expeditions. But I really, you know. Contact me if it's the stuff that we want to try to get into school because as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, you know, we were kind of a rogue 
program with distance learning, and we find that working with rogue teacher districts and administrators and, and, and disruptors in education moves us really far along yeah. and we have the great stuff so it's not the roller coaster video it's not the right we'll work with people to come up with things that work for students right so uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to email me um, I'm not sure I can give you my email now it's brad dot cray k-r-e-y at parks dot ca dot gov i'm sure there's some sort of virtual way i can make that appear somehow but i don't know how to do that <laughs> uh, but, uh, and and steve steve has my contact info and i'd be happy to talk with anybody because i do you know believe that this is a disruptive technology that yeah. will benefit students um just as i believe uh you know live video in the classroom was 15 you know years ago and continues yep. to be well, that's uh, thank awesome. you, Brad. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much. so much for doing that. And I'll remember Brad's email. Um, you can get a hold of uh, Stephen. His uh, his contact information is on the screen. He will definitely get you plugged in. Um, and these are kind of the problems Stephen are trying to help coordinate as well. So um, if uh, if y'all have ideas or whatever, and y'all need need someone to bounce some of those ideas off of or make connections with, reach out to us. We would love connect y'all with that so we can kind of advance this idea of shared VR experience connecting with experts. Love it. Thank you Very guys. Cool. If there's any questions, I just, again, Daniel, I see you doing the whole like uh, Chris Matson like uh, rail shots with the video there. And, uh, <laughs> I see what you're doing. But uh, I just, again, I want a huge shout out to Daniel, the organizers of educators in VR, right? All the platforms that are taking place, all the presenters and volunteers. And again, Absolutely. here specifically, James and myself and Brad, we just want to thank y'all for attending. Right. And awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We need a way to play. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Thank yeah. you, guys. Thank you. This was fantastic. I love the firsthand experiences. It makes such a difference to have mm -hmm. these case studies at the end. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. That's awesome. Love the work. Exciting for the future of this. It's great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. All right. We all have cool. a, a great rest of the conference. Um, we, there's some other things upcoming, so you know, make sure uh, that you click on uh, educatorscar.com. <laughs> <laughs> you need a couch to <laughs> lie down. <laughs> Exactly. Oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, guys. I, think, I think we're adjourned for the evening. All right. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. Thank you. I'll send y'all right. home. We'll see y'all later, right. everybody. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Thank you, okay, guys. <laughs>